when Arsenal knocks on the door of players, it's a different knock than other clubs. Clubs, clubs, clubs. The Different Knock, an Arsenal podcast. But what made you so sure that this was the best place and this was the right decision for you? It's Arsenal, you know. Ugh, come on, it's Arsenal. Welcome back to Nelson! An Arsenal podcast with Alexander Manny Benny and my very good friends, Bradley Adams and George V. Bradley, I want to. And just so you don't get confused, this is not a podcast about Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Thanks for that clarification, Brad. Um, I have just, just checking that out there. I have two questions for you, Brad. Yep. Here's the first. That Nelson goal yesterday, 97 minutes in, where does that... And George, I'll come to you on this as well. Where does that rank for you on the all-time Emirates moments? And second part of that question, and I'm talking, you know, Andre Arshavin against Barcelona. I'm talking uh, Danny Welbeck... 90th minute, 93rd minute against Leicester, Valentine's Day 2016. Second question, how are you such a jammy prick that you managed to be in the stadium <laughs> for that moment? And how was it? That's three questions. Um, I'll go I'll go for questions two and three and then I'll, I'll rank it. Uh, Raf, absolute legend, sorted me out a ticket. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, Wolves last season this this season um how did it feel i can't describe how it felt i don't have the words but what i what i can do is give you a play by play of what happened in the the goal went in and rohan and i looked at each other for what felt like 15 seconds but was probably a nanosecond grabbed each other screamed and then climbed on top of the chairs and then I immediately fell off on my ass and got helped back to my feet by a very lovely lady and Rohan. And I've never felt um, adrenaline like it. I've never felt it was it was unbelievable. Um, shame on the people that left because they missed. I mean, and I'll go on to where it ranks later for me, but definitely one of the best moments of all time at the Emirates. Um, I, the crowd deserved it for for sticking with. Um, what had happened in the first kind of 50 minutes and, 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 and letting those two goals in and, and the elation and the relief and the... Because there were real points where both Rohan and I turned to each other and, and said, I don't think we're going to pull this back here because it, it really did feel it like in the crowd, like momentum wasn't... It just wasn't going to be our day because of the amount of opportunities we'd had and just not quite taken. Um, I, I joked off off air that it was the best moment in my life. I'm not joking when I say it's definitely one of the most memorable moments of my life. Because I was at the end, that goal went in and I was on the right-hand side. So I was on the side of the box with a perfect view of Reese Nelson who had a storming game. That is one of the top moments of my life. Like elation-wise, memory-wise, everything. How connected I felt, how alive I felt. And... Um, I it and obviously it reminds me of the Wolves game, but that moment and to get onto the ranking for me, I think is joint top best moment ever at the Emirates uh, with the Andre Arshavin. I think the Andre Arshavin is such a big moment, beating Barcelona in their absolute pomp, doing something like special. This is one of those moments, and I think it it, it levels it if not beats it for me because. As much as the Welbeck header on Valentine's Day was cool, we were so garbage the second half of that season that it never felt like we were on the run into to winning that title. But um, but and that the Welbeck moment gave us a glimmer of hope. Whereas this, this isn't a glimmer of hope. This was this was a flag in the ground. Was this this was a moment cemented in time of the youngest team in the league saying that one, we're not going to put up with cheats and time wasters Two, we don't need good refereeing to win football matches because the ref had a stinker in, and not even just talking about the VAR moments, like just generally 
let the occasion get to him. Uh, and in opposite, he sometimes we say that referees um, allow the crowd to ref the game. He he did the opposite in that no matter how far he dug himself into the hole, he was refusing to do things because the crowd were asking for it. Um which just allowed the time wasting to go on and on and on. And then thirdly, that we are here and we are here to stay. And that moment will be cemented in time for eternity, for the next. That This will be a moment I tell my kids about when I take them to their first Arsenal game and I tell their gra- my grandkids about if I have them or whatever, when I take them to their first Arsenal game. I, I, this, this is such a big moment in time for a player who who um, has had a real struggle to the start of his career, the original star boy, the original Haylander out of this group to come through. And like watching him do that and watching him do that amongst a crowd that has that has gone through a generational shift. I've never seen a younger crowd at Arsenal than I am at the moment. Like I, I, I just don't have the superlatives. I really don't. And I've watched that Reese Nelson moment. I uh, uh, genuinely probably over a hundred times just on repeat last night, this morning, um, just on Twitter. And you watch it and you see something different every time. You see Ben White giving it to Neto, who a couple of moments earlier punched him in the back of the head. You see Saliba losing his absolute mind, going to take his own shirt off and then running and booting the corner flag, which was the first thing that I saw after being picked up off the floor by some random old lady, was just Saliba in front of me booting the corner flag. You see... Nelson's the calmest of the lot. Jorginho's run faster and turned quicker than he ever has in his life to get on and celebrate. And fucking Arteta's got some random person's kid. Uh, like, I, I can't, I actually cannot describe the madness and the chaos and the, the emotion that has been injected back into this team. And there is one person to thank, much like Granite Jacker's interview, it, it is Mikel Arteta. No disparaging what the boys have done, no disparaging what the board have done, no disparaging what Edu has done. The man behind this cultural and playing and relationship revolution between club player and fans is Mikel Arteta and every single ounce of thanks from every single fa- fan should go to him that's probably I, I could go, I could go on for an hour I've, I've spoken about it for six minutes I genuinely could just keep going there's so much more to say but I'll leave it there and I I, I, I feel so grateful that's that's the sentiment that's well, word of the game whatever mine is grateful I feel so grateful to be a fan of this football club yeah Well, yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, a beautiful. Be- it's just be- it's beautiful. It's 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 passion. It's like it's joy. Like you know, we can, you know, yeah, okay, it's a game, but it it means so much more. And you know, it's it's about the meanings we attach to it, and it's the friends we make along the way. But it is, you know, it's the it's the memories and the and the joy and the the connections. And I know you met like some new people from the Arsenal community, not new as in not new, but new in terms of meeting them in person yesterday as well and like you know like it, it, it is it's so significant George my word of the game is iconic because I feel if we're putting this in the kind of in the Emirates era and where this kind of sits and you know yeah you know trying not to be too uh trying not to go over the top but also not trying to not trying to undersell it in in the interest of um uh you know just hitting the sweet spot really something like the Andre Shavin, yeah we beat Barcelona, but we don't go on to win the Champions League. Danny Welbeck felt like the moment. Okay, this is the moment we we go on and win the title. You know, other 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 teams are uh, aren't in our position, and we can do this now. If we go on and win the title, I think this is the most iconic um, moment of the Emirates of moment. the em- Emirates. So yeah, certainly a most iconic Emirates moment of the last, well, p- possibly since we moved into the Emirates. But yeah, that's that's what it felt like to me. It felt like a moment in time, as Brad said, and. Um, if you want to see my reaction, you can go on Twitter. It was just, yeah, it was electric. But I know you, uh, you got called into work to save some sick kids, which you know, oh, classic, classic George, just saving <laughs> lives. <laughs> yes, yes. And for you know, and we were talking off air. I feel like I have a very different emotional tie to the game, and I was just so upset. I even remember tweeting, "How was it like?" And I had a follow up tweet where it was just kind of a case of there is a time for tactics. And then there's a time for emotion. Just enjoy it. 
And, and I think that's one thing about fans that we do sometimes learn to forget. Part of the job of being on a podcast is you're constantly analyzing. Part of the job of having this kind of commentary to a game is looking at the technical. But sometimes you don't. And, you know, my kind of word for the day is transformative. And really what I mean by that is I really have felt this young team um, are taking a step beyond that in these next few games. You know, when you look at it, I think Reese Nelson having this moment is so... Um, cathartic in so many different ways, as Brad had mentioned in terms of how he was the original star boy of that youth group. Um, the fact that we did it in the last play of the game in terms of getting that extra time from the refs after what the emotion was, I'm sure, of fans watching having been robbed of several handball moments. I mean, again, we talk about storylines with, you know, the Emmy Martinez headed goal backwards from Jorginho. We look at these things when we write the story of a season. And for me, it was absolutely transformative that we somehow came back not once, not twice, but did so in the supposed Fergie time on a weekend that, um, you know, saw the former English darlings, let's call it, beat in 7-0. Um, all this stuff matters to me in the perception of the club. And it matters to those They were worried about the pit. wrong seven. Yeah. <laughs> they were yeah, worried exactly. about the wrong seven. <laughs> They, they, they really were. And you, and you know what? To have Ben White score his first goal for the club, there was a lot of firsts that were happening. And, and I just feel as though that this Arsenal team, um, they're growing up before our eyes. Like, this is a moment of maturity. This is their prom for me. Like, when you start to look at these moments, this is what they remember in terms of getting that experience to take it over the line. And, and trust me, the, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that it's transformative of a game because you start to look at... Um, kind of what we have in front of us. We've got quite a few players coming back. We've got players that have been injured and we have gotten through it in a hard way. We have not given ourselves, um, you know, an easy way about it. And, and I think that's very significant to reminding this young team to keep themselves level, keep themselves on the ground, focus, but also give them the confidence that, listen, even though we're down, even though it's the last minute of the game, you try you don't leave. I, I don't want to criticize people, but, you know, I did see some on the rewatch. There were people that were leaving at some point in the at, 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 in the stadium. And, and that for me, I'm not a big fan of that. And I hate seeing that that could be an opportunity for some fans. And I don't want to harp on it because I don't want to use my little you do that. But that's the opposite mentality that this team should have. And I just love they're giving us evidence to s never see that again. Like, I love that attitude of never say die, keep going, keep pushing, because if you keep to your fundamentals, you'll find a way through. And I think that's going to be very important. That patience and that composure, i.e. in the final third, but also the run-in, is kind of a lesson for fans as much as it is for the players. So, no, I, I think it was transformative. I really don't think it's hyperbole to say it's the best Emirates moment, but I also just don't think we're, we're at a loss for more of these moments. I really think this young team are going to give you that because... They let you believe, don't they? The fact that they're so young, they don't hold that fear. When you talk about what's different between this team and last, and we'll get into the mentality things, one of the things I don't see people talking about is how fearless youngsters are. I mean, when somebody tells you you can't come back from 4-0, they say, why not? That's just the nature of being a youthful optimist. And this team have it in abundance, and they deserve all the credit for it. Uh, I agree with the Mikel Arteta praise, but also I'm going to give it to the players as well. Like, to, to continue to push like that is not easy. And it's not easy to not rush. We've blamed the team and our leaders for rushing actions in the last couple games. They didn't. They did not do that here. They kept to the principles and they're rewarded for it. So so kudos. There's so many narratives to to pick out. And as I, as I always bang on about how the reason football is so, is so amazing and so brilliant and so accessible is that narratives just seem to sort of pour out of this thing. Great storylines and great things that connect one another and, and you know ultimately one of the things that's separating humans from other mammals is the fact that we can tell each other stories and we can communicate in that way and sort of create different worlds and this is what it is you know it's this is what it's part of and whether it's you know Arsenal overcoming their kind of bottle job uh, sort of a label is it the hail end boys coming up clutch is it the Emirates Stadium changing is it the sort of homecoming of Mikel Arteta you know you could go anywhere with this and that's what's so joyous about it but I, I wanted to pick up on something you said George and slightly turn our attention to the game because 
I, I've been saying on I, we uh, little plug we do a, a rewatch with uh, Rohan who was at the at the game and I've been saying on a few of the rewatches recently when you get your fundamentals right you know there, there's obviously an easy not an easy there's a there's a, a clear storyline here of just kind of never give up never say die never give in which is absolutely true but also as part of that there's also a more kind of logical and rationalistic perspective on that in the sense that we just kept trying and at some point there is a kind of maths to it and it's like if you just keep putting the ball in the box at some point the ball is going to drop for you if you just keep in their half and keep playing around and keep trying to find an opportunity at some point you're going to get one and it happened to be in the most dramatic amazing style but George like on the rewatch from a tactical and and more um, I suppose more technical perspective as much as there is that absolute never say die attitude that kind of fuels this, I did. There was just a part of me, and the reason I, I even started filming and filmed my reaction was like, it's gonna have, it's gonna come. We're just, we're, it's like we're sort of we're in the barber shop. We're walking around. We're sitting in and out of chairs. At some point, we are gonna get a haircut. Like you hang around long enough, you will. And I did feel there was uh, issues, and, I, and I'll, I'll maybe put my kind of hypothesis uh, out there. I felt as though. Every action for a long period of the game was was either like two touches or a second too late. I felt like something needed to be first time, whether it was a, a shot first time, whether it was a, a one-two first time, whether it was a, a cutback or a yeah, long distance or a ball over the top or something needed to be first time to change the tempo. That's what I felt because I felt like we were doing, again, similarly to all the games this season, we were getting the fundamentals right. So on the rewatch, what did you feel like was kind of the block and how did you see that shift uh, shift around? Yeah, so I, I think uh, partly what we were facing was, you know, broadly speaking, a 5-4-1 block. I think what we do know is how teams are going to double up on the wingers. The one thing that I felt was the Fabio Vieira and Alexander Zinchenko dynamic, something that I think a lot of fans were interested in seeing, had some growing pains in terms of what they both wanted to do. And in particular, Zinchenko was forced a little bit more on the outside in this match in terms of providing a little bit more of an overlap because I felt that the pass, as you said, was a little bit sticky, but I just don't think that there was the same incision um, from the team um, in the middle of the park. I, I felt like what we were doing is we were forcing ourselves um, wide a little bit too often and we didn't pick the, the first option through the middle. Um, and, and I think that chance uh, of like trying to force that zone 14 entry was actually something that Jorginho was doing a little bit more in previous games that we didn't quite do in this game. And we went a little bit more to our older pattern of play where we did look to create through the width of the pitch. And I think with Emil Smith Rowe's introduction, um, what happened was you, you got less of that interchange in the front line and you got somebody that was more willing to stick on the touch line, but then you lost that creative passing on the, in the middle. And so you, you kind of traded one problem for another, and it wasn't until Reese Nelson's introduction in the second half that you had a more traditional winger that opened those avenues of rotation a little bit more. And so although in the first 20 minutes what you may have traded from a Zinchenko and Fabio Vieira finding some growing pains, both wanting to control and, and, and set the tempo, but none really maybe making the uh, third man run uh, kind of off the ball movement, you traded that problem for now having an Emil Smith Rowe who was happy to stay on the touchline and offer himself, but then you lacked a combination player on the inside with Trissard leaving, but then Fabio Vieira felt a little isolated. And so in that way, you didn't solve it until you got a player that was happy to be on the touchline, but also come inside and combine. And kind of Reese Nelson offered the best of both worlds in that aspect. Um, and so going forward, what does this mean? Um, I think it gave a timely reminder of some of the qualities that were missing. I think that Emil Smith Rowe wasn't a hundred percent fit too. That's the one thing I had to look at. I don't think he looked fit in terms of his burst. I thought his instinctual movement was excellent. He was in and around a box, and he's going to be a player that will find chances. But um, I didn't see the pop in his dribbling. Let's say, and the one thing that I didn't see also is having a Fabio Vieira at number eight is going to force us to change how we play. 
what do I mean by this? Um, when you find a Granite Shaka in kind of that half space, you're less likely to hit him first time in the channel because you know, as we've said, he slow he turns like a tractor, <laughs> to put it lightly. But when you've got a Fabio Vieira there that is tight in those interior, they want it under pressure. They want it in those tight spaces. We've avoided those spaces because we see them as a transition threat. Guys, we need to get used to firing those into those tight spaces because these guys can turn and they can turn their marker quickly. If you don't do that, you force yourself wide. You force yourself to predictable patterns. And there's been many times that I felt Fabio Vieira made some smart runs, but wasn't found. We weren't vertical enough because I don't think we trust that style of number eight in those half spaces quite yet. We've got a transition to it. We've got the players that can do it. But I just felt we left ourselves a little bit too predictable in the wings. And we kind of went through that method of chance creation as opposed to attacking through the middle. And it was ironic because Bradley, I'm sure you can comment on this. I felt like the warm-up, they would have practiced central running drills the most in this game. And I don't think we attacked through the center. But I saw on Twitter they were forcing a lot of patterns in the warm-up of people combining in the center for shooting, shooting drills. And I thought, well, that's excellent to see. I hope we do this in the match. But I don't think I saw that until maybe the second half. So um, that's probably the one tactical thing that I noticed. We traded one problem for another in the first half. And it wasn't until Reese Nelson's introduction that we got a more fluid rotation between what we needed and then lacked from a Trissard uh, absence. Yes, we do have an upcoming problem, don't we, with no Trissard, no Jesus, and no Enketia. And Brad, I wanted to get your take on this because it's interesting how we're going to approach that. Um, obviously, Xhaka, I suppose I suppose the lineup was interesting because it was a kind of it was a kind of maybe tacit or sort of uh, maybe implicit admission that this game should have been a bit more, should have, should have been played where it was, which, you know, it was played in those positions. The game state was different because of the the early goal and the set piece goal and stuff, which obviously it's never in the plan to concede, but certainly was not in the plan. So I think it felt as though we were going to have those combiners on the inside. Trossard goes out, we concede the early goal and then we're, we're stuck. Brad, I want to get your take on firstly Thursday and then Sunday, but also just kind of moving forward. Like how, how do we solve this? Because we are going to come up against slow blocks. Is it like, is it starting with Jorginho? Because I think Jorginho's got more of a kind of, it's like basically, you know, we could go over through or round, as I always say. It, Jorginho can take us over. Is it starting with a more traditional winger with Nelson? Um, you know, playing Nelson in, in that role. Is it putting Smith Rowe inside? Like, I don't know. I, I'm I'm kind of I'd be I'm going to be I I feel like we might see some structural change um, over the next few weeks to kind of cope without those those players. Yeah, a lot to kind of unpack there. In terms of th kind of the sporting game, it's going to be a really bad analysis, but I don't care because I think that we're, uh, we're in triage now. We have to find the best solution, and if that means weakening things versus sporting, so that we're we've got a, a front line that's cohesive and fully fit and ready for for Sunday. Um, I'm very much of that mentality. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I kind of, I'm looking towards the Fulham game and going, how quickly can we find a solution for that? Because I think, I think sporting's a bit too early. Um, and I don't think we'll have had enough time on the training pitch after rest days and stuff to, to really glue something in. So I, I haven't been able to rewatch yet. But one thing I will say from being there is Martinelli, uh, I thought, was excellent at centre forward. I thought he was really direct. Uh, I thought his finishing left a little to be desired on the pitch. The, the moment where he's, he, he speeds away and puts it over the bar, really, you need to, to be a goal in those moments. And if we're going to, you know, slate and Ketia for moments that he's had where he hasn't put them away, we have to do, to do the same with Martinelli. But I think as one problem has arisen with Trossard, Nelson... Uh, and Smith Rowe seem to have both provided a very interesting solution in that neither of them seem seemingly are fully fit yet, but are fit enough for for kind of forty five minutes of football each. Um, and so I think that that would be my plan moving forward. I don't want to change the dynamic on the right hand side. Uh, I think as much as we lose the interchanges with the central zones. Uh, by having Martinelli there and no Trossard and, you know, neither Smithrow or Nelson offers that. I think what I saw was that left, 
that left hand side operated, especially when Nelson was on really well and really fluidly with with Vieira in that eight and Zinchenko, because there was lots of different times where either Zinchenko was overlapping or Vieira was overlapping. There was, there was quite a lot of combination there. And whilst I don't think it was in the centre, and that's something we we definitely need to improve on, I think the early goal knocked the confidence out of firing those risky balls in. And we saw it in the crowd as well. That early goal really took the kind of energy out for a good kind of half an hour, probably if not the first half. For Sporting and Fulham, um, I think we're going to have to go with the Martinelli through the middle because we don't have another centre forward. So, I mean, I'm not pulling up any trees with that analysis. Um, but I think that Nelson has given us a real headache in that that performance, even by numbers, was excellent. Um, and I would be looking to against um, against Fulham and kind of, I think it's Kenny Tete, their right back, um, be giving him the starting berth because I think two explosive, tricky wingers on either side who can cause problems and create is going to free up space in the middle of a four-man defence for Martinelli to just absolutely burst out. Thank goodness Rousseau is um, not up against Cedric. I mean, that would be... <laughs> oh, God, that'd be a nightmare. A serious problem. Um, but I, no, I think that that's, that's probably the solution I go with, mainly because I think, like George, George says, Smith-Rowe's burst is not there yet, and I think I'd rather have a like-for-like like almost tricky winger who is able to take somebody on and cause some chaos um and then maybe we can experiment with putting smith rowe as some kind of central running power that would be something hey, I'd there really it be is in. as long as i didn't say it first um no you're, you're spot on but the one thing <laughs> that you know i wanted to just talk about very quickly we have to start asking ourselves uh about the focal point of the attack i think we've all alluded to it in the podcast in terms of the summer what is the forward line addition? And we all have question marks about where this attack is going. I always like to say your striker dictates what the rest of your front line is doing. And I have a nice couple rules as a coach I love to do where it's I love to have two runners and two creators in my front line. That is the mix that I'd like in my front four quite generally. When you look at Martinelli, what is he at striker? He's a runner. He, he is somebody that lives off the shoulder of the defense. He's somebody that can combine and offer himself and both spaces, but he is a channel runner. So when you've got somebody that's a channel runner that maybe doesn't have the same technical security in tight spaces that a Trossard does, you need to flank him with that. And so that is a Reese Nelson, who is a pseudo 10 in quotation marks. That is a Bukayo Saka. Bukayo Saka is a unicorn. He can do both touchline and inside rules. But Reese Nelson is much more of that pseudo 10. And when you look at the other left wings that we did have there as options, Emile Smith-Rowe can do that. But when he plays the left wing role, he's actually more of a touchline winger on the left because he doesn't have the same convincing overlap. And so he attacks and he's a runner. That is why, for me, that didn't work. You had two runners on the same side that really liked that in terms of having A, Emil Smith-Rowe, and then Martinelli. You need to surround Martinelli with somebody that is going to do the tight space work for him because he's not going to do it. So you do need a Bukayo Saka and a Reese Nelson. You need that kind of extra 10, your Sancho-like. Those are the wingers that you need with a runner type at center forward. We've seen it with Holland, by the way. Uh, your Grealish, your Mares, that's the wing pairing that works best, and it's because of that dynamic of what that central uh, kind of runner does and demands. And, and that's very different to a Trissard, right? So I, I do think that if you're looking forward, you need to match up your center forward with that strength. And that's actually why uh, a Martinelli works with a Trissard in the alternate way. So a Trissard, who likes to come deep, by the way, operate in tight spaces, needs a runner on the wings to complement him. And that's why Martinelli works very well with him. That's maybe why other people don't quite work with Trissard if you were going to maybe say an Eddie and Kedia. So I just think that we need to get really good at understanding those partnerships and those complementary uh, synergistic partnerships because that's the key for me finding the best partners maybe not the best players but the best partners yeah i hear that and i think it's it's a really important and really good point i've been interested in seeing smith row at false nine as well uh, i wonder wonder how that dynamic might work brad did you know george has his b license <laughs> yes yes i saw on the i'd have on that tattooed on my face chat. mate i would literally have that tattooed on my face <laughs> yeah unbelievable scenes um I just want to come to uh, Tommy Asu's performance. Um, oh, God. <laughs> Go on, Brad. God. 
I didn't think he was. Um, look, okay, he makes a very obvious error when he's th- he's in behind. He sort of trips over his own feet or something, and he it wasn't great. I, I also I want to come to. I don't think just what just one second. I just want to pre- prelude this because I've been having a look at our our goals conceded this season. We've scored. Uh, we've conceded fourteen from open play, seven from set pieces, and five have been individual mistakes. Only one of those individual mistakes was Tommy Asu. Um, but I think in the open play, I've sort of gone through and gone, okay, that's more about individual quality. Someone like Rashford, okay, Partey loses the ball, but I mean, that's an unbelievable strike in the United game for Rashford. But actually, I've, for example, I think it's the Southampton goal, forget the guy's name. And uh, there's another game as well. Oh, the um, the Brighton game, Matoma. Tommy Asu's at fault for both of those. I appreciate that he's in and out of the team. It's tricky, but there's a... Especially some of those early ones. Yeah. Like he'd been out of the team for a while. I just do have a growing concern about him. I think I can answer your concern. Please do. In that we... There's been a massive change in the I'm dynamics sure I'm my rent of... And I'm just worried about my relationships. Oh. And <laughs> you know that, Alex, be, you know that okay. better help advert where he's like, what do you want? I want a job I don't hate. And then he's like, no, no, from the... <laughs> Takeaway. I love that first. It's so good. <laughs> Go on, bro. Um, I think there's been a massive structural change in what we're asking our fullbacks to do. And I think that last season, if you look at the, the five attackers and the five lanes, the fullback pairing was Tommy Asu and Tierney. And why that works so well is what I've come to realise is Tommy Asu is a centre-back. Tommy Asu is not a right back, especially in this system. When we had Kieran Tierney bombing along so long, Tommy Asu is great in build up. He's great pushing up kind of from the defence into the midfield and being secure with the ball and, and playing passes. But if you get him into the final third, he is quite stiff and his crossing just isn't up to scratch. Um, and what where we have evolved to demands a different type of profile on that right-hand side, which is why we've seen Ben White move out there and which is why I think uh, for next season, the future will be Tommy Asu is our kind of second right centre-back behind William Saliba. And I would not be surprised if we signed a right-back because Tommy Asu has always been, I think, a centre-back. Exactly. I think he's always been a centre-back playing a right-back. And when we, if we look back to last season, we were in that three. We did have White, Gabrielle and Tommy Asu working as kind of one succinct unit with Tierney bombing on rather than what we seem to be now. So I I don't think Tommy Asu's... It's really hard to, to blame Tommy Asu for his performance. The way that I describe it, it's, it was like asking a fish to climb a tree. It's not what he's good at. It's not what he does. It's not what we should have expected from him. And whilst I think this was the perfect game to bring some rotation in, because this was Bournemouth, you know, their relegation side, the, the quality of team is not large. And, you know, both of their goals come from us absolutely falling asleep. Um, it then put him in a situation where he was having to do things that are not his skill set. It would be like asking Gabriel Jesus to play number eight. He'd probably do it to an all right fashion, but there would be (laughs) always, but there'd always be moments where you'd be crying out for somebody who's specialised in that area. And I think if, if you look at what we're asking Saliba to do this season, and you're looking at what we asked um, Tommy Asu to do this season, last season, uh, it that makes more I sense hear. to me now, and I think that that's why there's a right back coming in, kind of imminently I to to back up Ben White. I hear you. I, I don't want to shut you out of this, George. Uh, just very briefly, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, r- really quickly. I actually am just going to go a bit step further with Brad. I think the real role change is Martin Odegaard um, and where we want Bakayo Saka, and, and that is last season we wanted him at lane five. Uh, and so when you looked at it, Martin Odegaard was much more a final third player last season. This season, he likes to drop off and operate in that middle three. So when we're in the final third, we all know we operate with a 2-3-5. Martin Odegaard is likely to be in that third. And Tommy Asu does not like to deviate from that position. And I constantly say on the podcast, don't put players that want to do the same things in the same zone together. And the demand is by changing Martin Odegaard's role to be a little bit deeper and operate from deep, you are asking your fullback to provide that overlap if you want Bukayo Saka inside, which is inevitably what we all want, what we've all been screaming. 
And I think that's been the biggest change. And like you said, Brad, like I'm the same way. I see Tommy Asu as a center back. I have for a while. Um, but beyond that, I think the right back won't be like this. When you look at Fresneda, he is somebody that has the technical ability and build up to offer what that kind of third midfielder would do. But he has that running power of that dynamism to really provide that overlap. And especially when oppositions are doubling up on your wingers, it puts extra demand to create kind of that dynamic running power on the outside. That can come from your midfielder or it can come from fullback. But I will say, as long as you have Martin Odegaard in the team, your fullback is always going to be the one asked to do that on that side because he doesn't provide that same overlap. And in the same way you wouldn't ever ask him to do. I don't think we're going to ask Martin Odegaard to provide that because you have an Emile Smith-Rowe that could do that as well. So it's just about roles, right? And it's just about jobs and asking them to do. I'm with you, though. I, I think there's a decision that we have to make. I hear that. I hear that. Uh, Brad, get really angry about the officials. Go. Um, uh, handballs. I, I can't. I'm too happy. Call I'm them all. Happy, call mate. them all silly sausages or something. <sighs> Absolute silly sausages. Silly sizzling sausages. Um, <laughs> so five times fast. I, silly, silly sizzling sausages. Silly, 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 <laughs> no chance. Listen, I. It's incompetence. I think the corruption calls are a bit too far gone. Um, I was joking, but all right. I just don't uh, understand how <laughs> not one of them was given. Not a single one. I like. I've watched them all back, and I'm looking at that, going, like, I, and I think I'm just starting to get confused as to what a handball is now, because some of those to me just seem so clear cut. Like one of them, he misjudges the flight of the ball. His arms up in the air, and it hits him on the arm. Handball. One of them, he moves his. It's from Bukayo Saka's cross. He literally moves his arm towards it. I, I am just starting to forget to understand. I just don't understand the rules of football anymore, and like it's become so convoluted. Um, as to oh it can't it like the distances that the ball can be hit at you from you know if it's too close it can't be a handball but if he stood like fucking sideshow Bob with like two arms out doing some fucking star jumps what like is just confusing me now I don't yeah what's a handball I Alex? literally was joking it, does that all yeah, exist great. Mate, Octo Gunner on Twitter will love that. Listen, um, Octo, yeah. Octo, <laughs> oh, that's the only reason I did it, mate. Octo. He asked for they it. Ask Octo. and you shall receive, Octo brother. Gunner is one of the original... Like Nathan Baroda. Where's Nathan Baroda, man? One of the original... Nathan diff, Baroda diff and knockers. Cluid and oh, Cluid. Debs. Debs, legends. We should get them badges and send we them should. badges. Different knock badges. Don't give me more... OG, We haven't got the TDK. budget, Brad. Um, I want to read some stats uh, <laughs> and then talk about mentality. Arsenal, 121 deep touches. Bournemouth, 10. Arsenal, 69. Wait, zone 14 touches. Bournemouth, 0. Arsenal, 109 final third entries. Bournemouth, 16. Arsenal field tilt, 92.1%. Bournemouth, 7.9. Possession, 80.6. 30 shots, 18 from open play. There is There was a total and utter domination that we can all see with our eyes but we can start back up with the facts but this team did not relent and this is the there's something like you know fourth in seven or something late goals we scored i can think of this season at the emirates you're thinking of that gabriel one at 85th minute you're thinking the Jorginho goal you're thinking of the nelson goal you're thinking of the inketia goal there is mentality is difficult to define but i suppose what there is is a tenacity and a resilience to this team that comes from many different places. And and, uh, and actually, Brad, I'll come back to you on this one. Like, It's got to be loads of different things, right? It's got to be the additions of Jesus and Zinchenko. It's got to be the natural maturation of the likes of Odegaard, Gabriel, Saka, etc., etc. It's got to be the stadium. It's got to be a number of things. But what, what do you put that down to kind of primarily? Or do you think that it is just a, a kind of multitude of things? I think it's difficult to kind of, especially because we're not, surprise, surprise listeners, we're not working for Arsenal. We're not in and around the camp. We're so. on Cronky's payroll, mate. We're on Cronky's payroll. <laughs> yeah, George we're not on the Cronky's George payroll. George is 100% on Cronky's payroll. <laughs> Big time. Oh, absolutely. But because we're not there, I don't think we can attribute it largely to any one factor. Because as much as we've seen the impact on the pitch from Zinchenko and, and Jesus and their kind of winning mentality, we don't know how much of an impact it's had off the pitch. One thing that I... I think I think all of these things play an effect. We often 
look at, I think it was the Europa League final that Klopp lost as a moment that helped harden mentalities and change traje- trajectories almost. And I think losing out on top four was that for this team last season. I think back to um, the Arsenal all or noth- nothing and the, and the moment where Arteta said to them, it doesn't matter what I say now, it doesn't matter what you say now, it's too late. And I, I look at that moment and I look at what happened and a lot of it down to injury and, and whatever. And I go, that that's a moment where one of two things happen. You grow and learn or you fall apart. And I think pretty much collectively, we have moved on from it and we've learned from it and we've grown. Um, and that's a, that's a big one for me, um, as well as, you know, the, uh, the additions of, of players who know how to win league titles and know that if it's 2-2 in the 92nd minute, you've got three extra minutes, that a goal can be scored against bloody Bournemouth when we've been battering them. There were some accounts of uh, Jorginho like pushing Zinchenko back onto the pitch, like last minutes and stuff, and like watching Jesus at the side in his Arsenal kit, like not even in the squad, but still just willing them on. And it's like that thing of, you, it's like what is a winner? You know, like Alexander Butner won a Premier League title. It's like, what does that mean? You know, it's like okay, you won titles doesn't mean you're a winner. But it's, Danny Welbeck's got a Premier League medal. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like there's like a a force in you, you just whatever team you're on, whatever you're trying to do, you want to win. Jack has got it. Like it doesn't matter. It, you don't necessarily have to be the best player in the world, but just that thing of like refusing to lose. And I think it's a, it is, it is ultimately a continuous try. Significant thing. Like yeah, as in, but, but I was going to, I was just going to say that I also think a team is ultimately a reflection of its manager. And it's kind of an extension mm-hmm. of, of a, per, of almost a persona or personality. And I think whether it is Arteta or It's the or same not. in business. It's yeah. the same in, in, in literally everything. Like because, what somebody that's running the entire organisation is going to have a massive... Like we talk about culture setters in terms of the squad. That happens in, in everyday work. Yeah, you have... Exactly. Like you, if your boss is a wanker, that is going to create a terrible atmosphere. Brad, are you calling me out? But if your boss is a great... <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, but if your boss is an amazing person who always supports you and really pushes you to be better and, and keeps you motivated... Oh, and and, all, um, and it's like not sexy about Alex, and handsome. Um, <laughs> and it's got great curly hair. But if, if you have somebody leading your entire ethos and your entire company with that mentality that is going to trickle down and i mean it that 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 will maybe also have some impact from how the cronkies are behind the scenes which is something we don't see Get a lot out. Of, and you know how they are yeah no i'll buy that i'll buy that a couple more things um george are we worried about the early goal cuz arteta said uh he knew that they could do that it was a bit of a weird setup i don't know if you noticed but we were, we were like sort of is is the word constatinated I'm going to say that we were doubled up anyway on seemed to be more players on the right hand side and then they just targeted our left maybe we assumed we were, they were going the other way or I, I don't know are you worried about that I'm not it feels like we knew that was no. happening but it just we couldn't stop it <laughs> yeah, yeah well uh, okay the one thing I am slightly worried about is the the manner of transitions not that goal but some of the transitions that we've been giving away I, I think I am a little bit worried about but I do I must say it's become a result of our change in tactics and midfield where we employ this more box midfield. And again, uh, I've been calling for this for quite a while, but it's, it's going to be a learning curve that this team has to do um, in transitioning Stop to a watching TIFO. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, but you know what, for me, I've been calling for this team to go to a box with a two, two, six for a while. And I, and I've said, there's going to be some transitions to it. I'm so glad we're seeing it, but this is one of the growing pains and it is going to come from an open transition model. And that's just because we are um, leaving a little bit more work to do for our athletes. That, that's really what it is. You know, we're, we're committing more bodies forward. So you're going to see it. Um, I think worried is the wrong word, but I do think that our center backs are going to be challenged a lot more, not just now, but in the future. And it's going to be added by not having three at the back. Like I said, I see a 226 developing in this team long term it's going to be even worse. We're going to add more pressure on this box to defend, but also to attack in the same way. Uh, so I'm not worried. 
uh, from it. I, I must say, though, that you're going to need to be comfortable with our center backs and races. And this is why you you get two huge athletes that are able to do it and why you target a carbohydrate side dish to help you with that, um, you know, in the summer as well, because that's something that they're going to be facing quite a bit of. Um, it was the second fastest goal in Premier League history, too, by the way, nine seconds. Uh, so very difficult to say tactically that is the reason. I think it's just a case In hilarious fashion, it yeah. shouldn't have stood. Yes. Because there's th two players encroaching over the halfway line oh. before mm. kickoff has, has been taken. I don't really give a shit because I think we deserved it for not being awake oh. and not making the challenge. But as in... Arsenal fans like, will find it, as in, I just anything. find it quite funny. Anything. No, it's just quite <laughs> funny, isn't it? I saw that tweet and I was like, classic, classic. Somebody, Of course somebody's found that. At the expense of not taking over the host duties, one thing that I did want to ask you guys is what you felt of Aaron Ramsdale's performance, not just now, but recently. Oh. Uh, because I think he's been criminally underrated in his approach to this season, and we are asking him to become a sweeper-keeper by nature. And, and I think the one transition moment, if you did want me to be upset, mate, is that one where, you know, I feeling want you is to be through. Upset. <laughs> uh, yes. It's my <laughs> aim for the podcast. Way, Exactly, but that is one where I'm like, that's unacceptable because it was a three on one, and he, he was offside. He was, but I'm more upset at so, how he broke through. So the pass is offside, but how he's in space, we can't let that happen with quality because yeah, no, he I won't get be offside. So I think the sweeper keeper role of Aaron Ramsdale is going to be super important. He times that perfectly, by the way. Allison has made his career off being a stud at that. And I do think that we're going to be looking at Aaron Ramsdale's performances as a method of growth there because I just wanted to shout him out. He's been excellent for a while, not just this game. 100%. And he's starting to become that kind of clutch. He's getting quite a few clutch moments at the moment of sort of like keeping you in the game. Tight. And you just yeah. you do need that from your keeper. Ultimately, if you're playing a high line and you're, you know, you're playing with that much space in behind, you're going to need your keeper at times. It's going to happen. It's, you know, obviously, you want to reduce it. And I agree. We, I worry about the transitions too. And hopefully... Rodrigo Pasta will come in and um, will uh, will sort us all out. But yeah, I think it's uh, I think it is definitely a concern. But yeah, no, you're right to shout out Ramsdale. I thought you know there was a moment. I think was it U Uatara? Is that his name? Utara. That save from him was oh, terrific. Um, me and me and Jiv turned to each other and said, if we win this game, that is one of the moments that we want it, and we will never talk about it because we'll talk about the late goals and stuff. But that save, even though Billings offside for the pass through. It, it was monstrous. Like, good save. Uh, speaking of saving, I'll save what I was going to say for news and views. I'll just finish with this. Yesterday was the first time since 1986 that an Arsenal starting lineup has not had a player who made a competitive appearance under Arsene Wenger. Crazy stat. RIP. He's not, he's not dead. <laughs> Jesus Christ, bro. <laughs> we'll it see. is representative of the uh, of the squad change, though. Like, uh, I don't want to, at the expense of uh, just overcomplicating the simple, I think that's a huge stat, by the way, that shouldn't be overlooked because uh, it's taken us three years to do that, by the way. Like, it, it's it's been the result of a lot of hard work Nearly 40 years, lads. It, it's insane. And, and I do think that that is kind of the biggest uh, turning point, if you must, of the new era. Uh, having that gone and everybody knows how much i love the man uh in terms of his ideology what he did for me um but i i do think it's significant that an arsenal team have in essence created their own identity away from that and it's taken three years it's taken that long for mikel who is amazing in him, of himself to do that so I, I think that's really good yeah and it's great to do it in a clutch game because i think you know if there's a criticism of Wenger, especially uh, in his latter latter years, it was that mentally we we were not particularly strong. Bramley, Apples, we'll see you after this. News and views. Welcome back to News and Views, where we give you all the news and all your views, but mostly ours. Thank you to those of you who are in the Different Knock Members Club. You, yes, you listening, can join too at patreon.com forward slash Diff Knock and get access to ad free versions of all of our content, which includes main podcasts like this one, bonus podcasts, Insta reactions, which uh, Brad and George occasionally turn up to, the rewatch with Rohan Jiva, and bonus video. Co he was saving lives. Uh, bonus video content for just £3 a month, less than the price of a coffee. Speaking for coffee, one-time support heads at buymecoffee.com forward slash if not where you can 
buy me a coffee. The links are in the show description. Brad, how big was your granite Jacobona watching that clip when he said, <laughs> there is one man and his name oh. is Miguel Adeta. Is Miguel Adeta? Oh. It was beautiful. I can't it believe, beautiful. genuinely, I wish, I wish we could go back in time and show you... And show me in, an, me in a granite jacker now. 34 top. I, George, I cannot tell you oh. how much Brad hated <laughs> granite jacker. It was like a I, visceral. I, I, it was like it wasn't. It wasn't just yeah. like a oh, I, oh he's a bit annoyed. It was like a sort of. You could see the sort of the the, the sinews was, yeah, of his guttural. muscles, like just. <laughs> <laughs> With every sinew, Brad hated him. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I fucking love him now. Yeah. What a man! Oh, what a man! What a man! He'll be he'll be a coach, but he'll I don't think he, he, he he'll funny struggle from the game. He'll struggle because he's so intense. Oh yeah! Like even like even Mikel has oh, yeah. has like a social kind of like when he's relaxed. Like if he's in his interview with Amy Lawrence, he's got like a quite a soft aspect to him. I think Jack has got to find that. Otherwise, he's going to struggle. I think I think Jack would be a great assistant manager. Yeah, big time. You're a great shout because he is somebody that can pull out the hairdryer, can be intense and allow the manager to not have to do those difficult things. Funny story about Granite Xhaka, warming up just before he came on. I think we, I can't remember who had the chance. I think it was an Erdegaard shot from, um, from outside the box uh, and he stood at the edge of the box, uh, 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 stood at the touchline uh, and I, I think I saw him say something like, uh, puta madre. <laughs> Uh, which is not a very nice language, which he's obviously learned from Arteta about uh, the player that blocked Erdegaard's shot. Uh, um, but yeah, I just found that quite funny. <laughs> oh, madre. oh, we can, yeah, we can swear in Spanish. We've had oh, some, e- we've had some emails and listeners from people t- telling me off as well. Yeah, so maybe we can swear in Spanish. Fuck it, Brad. Um, ah, <laughs> uh, I asked George if he was worried about something, so I'll ask you now, Brad. Are you worried? about our set piece goals and let me just give you a stat to uh push you on your way we've conceded set, seven set pieces as i said earlier two were penalties obviously the the traditional harry kane penalty and the side ben rama one but we've harry conceded kane. we've conceded four from uh, not from corners from set pieces fairly recently the tarkovsky goal the ivan tony goal against brentford i know it should be ruled out but you know it was from a set piece uh lissandra martinez and senesi and we also conceded that douglas louise goal of course but feels like there's a trend appearing i don't like it yeah i mean you have to take away three of those goals so the trend disappears a little bit. Douglas Luiz should have been ruled out for a foul on Ramsdale. Lissandro Martinez is, you know, flappy hands of our own making. None of them were real. They're not. No, <laughs> no. But as in, like, it's it's important to note that, like, when a t- when a, when a team plays its line well and catches them offside, or like a goal goes in because they're fouling the goalkeeper, it doesn't hold the same validity. Um, I think there is a problem with our set pieces going on, on at both ends at the moment. I mean, other than this, the Zinchenko one, which I'm not counting in this because it's not what I actually mean. But like the last time we scored from the first phase of a corner, like actually getting in the box um, rather than a short corner feels like a while ago. Um, and we've also then obviously struggled to do. It feels like we've started to struggle to defend them as well. Um I, m- maybe I, th- I think there just needs to be a bit more variety especially with the offensive corners we m- both me Jiv and the guy that was stood next to us um, were saying that we're consistently trying How these the corners, short corners offensive? you're such a snowflake so offensive um, we and when they weren't working we needed to have a bit more variety but, but kind of five or six corners in a row were all short and it just wasn't working I think maybe some work does need to be done on a training pitch because we're not. We don't seem to be as physically dominant in the air as we were last season. These, like, I remember, we didn't concede a goal from a corner for like twenty-five games or something ridiculous. Yeah, we had some mad set piece stats. Yeah, go on, George. Uh, really quickly, I I think it's. I'm definitely worried defensively. I think we need to switch that. Uh, but offensively, I have noticed a difference just from a coaching angle. Last season, we attacked near post quite a bit. We're not doing that this season. 
Uh, what we're doing right now is we're actually looking for the outside ball. Even in our short corner routines, in terms of quick shots, we've targeted the top of the D and the top of the penalty spot as areas to attack in a second phase. And, def and we've def done sorry, that. Sorry, define outside ball. So in terms of kind of, for us, we've attacked the six-yard box last season and the front post uh, and, and the near post for that matter. In this, in this season, we've attacked kind of that in between the six yard box to kind of the 18th. And we've asked not just Reese Nelson, but if you look even in the Emil Smith row chance, and even in terms of the Thomas Partey first time shots from short corners, we have asked ourselves to create the space in between those two boxes and then use that to score as opposed to a knock on in the front post. And I think that's because there's a lot more chance involved in the front post and we've crashed the box early to create the space behind. That, for me, has been the biggest offensive change um, when we're looking at it from an offensive set-piece point of view. Um, and we've done it kind of all season, to be honest with you. And I think it's just a matter of creating more space because we aren't a tall team. We're a tall uh, defense, but I don't think we're a tall team. And so what it does is you basically gamble on Gabrielle Parte, um, Saliba, but was Ben White in the front post of last season winning that duel. And that is a great tactic when it works. But it, it's really um, quite easy to mark when you're an opposition set piece coach. What this does, by creating space both at the front post and the back post at the top of the box, it forces them to remove markers deep and create space in that six-yard box because they've got to mark the people up top. And, and that's been the dichotomy that I think a lot of teams have been doing. Do I follow Thomas Partey at the top of the box? Do I follow Reese Nelson at the top of the box? Or... Do I add a person in the six-yard box just to defend the second ball? I don't think teams have been picking up the fact that we like to load at the top of the box and force teams to go back. That has been the biggest change offensively. Defensively, I don't love how we're picking up um, kind of players in the middle of the park. I, I think we're having a little bit more Partey of a zonal approach. Loses his man, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. And, but I also feel we have a lot of mismatches. If you go back to some of those set-piece goals, Tarkovsky, for example, Martin Odegaard yeah, marks him quite a bit. And, yeah. and that's and for me, I don't care structurally that you're marking him. That's a horrible mismatch. Like Thomas Partey, tell him to get out <laughs> and pick up somebody else. That's one of their best headers of the ball, period. So, so pick up on that. Um, I, I don't think we've been as cute in that regard. Last season, I felt that the matches were very well thought out this year i don't think so i think if anybody who's there is just picking up the role oh mate absolute voot sass clinic today yeah i, I never even noticed <laughs> that brad if it was just me, me and you i'd just gone we, we should try and score more goals i think <laughs> yeah i think what we should do from set more goals from corner please is try and score did you know i learned <laughs> this keep, in a keep them out yeah yeah and <laughs> yeah but what's that sean dutch quote <laughs> Stick it in that head. Stick Stop it in the head. Stop going Um Yeah, the the I, I read it. I read a um a thing in a Tifo thing. It was like there's a two percent chance of scoring from a corner. So you know when the now when the ball goes out and everyone goes, oh go on. I'm like no oh, two percent, <laughs> which is good, both good both good and bad. You're like you know from if you're if it's you know late in the game and you're like you know holding on to a slender lead. I'm like it's all right, it's fine. Um, but yeah. Uh, let's before we get to some questions can we just quickly laugh at Man United <laughs> guys this has been a brilliant weekend for Arsenal and United Tottenham. lost 7-0 Tottenham lost Chelsea won so Potter keeps his job for a little while longer to, to get him down even closer to the relegation zone at oh. the expense of going into banter, certainly the worst do Premier that. League loss. We we, we in don't history. like that on this podcast. <laughs> no. Oh, it's the worst Premier League loss in history. It's, right? Wait, what? Uh, I, it's it certainly surpasses the eight two from a perspective of you, a youth like, team versus it's first got, team. It's the worst team. Premier League. Yeah. A hundred percent. Horrendous. I'm putting myself down there. You know, it has yeah, no bias okay. at all. They had their in, they had their they had their entire first eleven on the pitch, bar Anthony Martial. Right, they they didn't score. At least we scored twice. So technically, if we're if it, technically ours, maybe we could count it as a six 0 And then we have like Ignacy Mikel at right back or something. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. yeah, we had we we were playing youth, and they like Liverpool. It's not like Liverpool have been ripping up trees this season, and they they conceded six second half goals. 
It's the worst performance in Premier League history, mate. It's it's so funny. It's it's a hilarious. I don't think there's been a worse Premier League loss. Uh, I'm on record right now. I think it okay. is the worst one. I buy that. I was wishing I for that. eight. I was wishing for eight purely because Narrative. then like it's it's ir- it's irrefutable. But it's irrefutable <laughs> anyway. That's horrendous. Their goal difference is at six. That's crazy. <laughs> City's just above them at forty-one. <laughs> That's mad. Um, just turning your attention to City really quickly before we get to some questions. Uh, someone made this point. I can't remember who it is now. It might have been Tim Stillman, but I'm not 100% sure. That there is this kind of thing, and obviously it's it's like <laughs> spearheaded or like faced up by Gary Neville, that this kind of thing of like, at some point City are going to catch us kind of thing. But you just sort of go... that Ultimately, and, and James McNicholas actually made another good point, is that okay, there's there's a lot of precedent for City doing well, but there's also very little precedent for a team winning a league three years in a row. There's very little precedent mm-hmm. for that. So as much as there's precedent for City doing well in leagues, and it also just, this this City team, and, and, and maybe Brad, you can you can call Pep bold or something. Um, the This City team doesn't feel like the City team of old. It's not. And that's because they sold a shitload of players. It's not the same group. So <laughs> they don't have this. Yeah, they don't have. But it's, it's also just a pure question of they don't have the same depth in in options anymore. And you look at the fact that they're still in the FA Cup. They're still in the Champions League. They've still got to go to Selhurst Park and get a result. They've still got to go to the Amex. We've still got to play them. They've still got to play Liverpool. They've still got to play Everton and Leeds as two of their last four games of the season. They've got Brentford away on the last day. Like, they've got some really difficult fixtures. They don't have the squad depth they once did. And if they are still in the Champions League, their their entire egg will be... It will just be in that basket. City, because they have been so uh, amazingly successful within the Premier League, won four of the last five they are obviously going to concentrate on the the one thing that they don't have, which is the Champions League. So for Arsenal fans, we just need to make sure that we're, we're, we're City supporters against Leipzig and that we're City supporters against Burnley for the FA Cup to give them more of, of, of a fixture congestion. But it's, it's not the City of old. They, City have also dropped points to more teams outside the top six this season than they have to teams inside the top six. Like they're, it's not games against City or games against Liverpool that win you the league, in my opinion. It's these games against Bournemouth where, you know, you switch off, you concede a goal within nine seconds because, you know, you're up against 19th in the league and you think it's going to be a cakewalk. So you're not 100 percent mentally switched on. And those are the games that, that that fuck you over the course of a season. And City have dropped points in lots of them. Them going to Selhurst is not a guarantee. Them going up against uh, Brighton at home is not a guarantee. Them facing Liverpool, who have just beaten United 7-0, had to get that back in there, is not a guarantee. <laughs> like, you, you have to understand... Like, and I think this is where... This is why Gary Neville failed as a coach and it's why he's the worst pundit is his opinion is not informed by um, by fresh information. I feel bad. I like like him. (laughs) He's basing basing his opinion and his ideals off of the Centurions from two, three years ago. I do agree with that. and, And City from last season rather than what they have been over the last calendar year really they were having some problems come the end of last season and they had to pull it out of the bag on the final day to win the league and then they sold three of the players who had a massive impact in them winning that league yeah like no he George, George I want to give you a chance to respond on that but I also want to ask you a question from Ben Golden at Neo Neo Ben Golden who says although it's very funny that United lost 7-0 it has me scared shitless over our Anfield visit coming up how scared are you and do you agree with that kind of thing of like you know you never want to throw a fixture but I, I kind of do buy you know, over the course of a season I do buy that thing of like as long as you do okay in those games against the top six and don't get absolutely mullered it is those games against the Bournemouths and the Palaces and the Wolves and stuff that those those fixtures do tot up and you know it's it's maths isn't it at the end of the day but psychologically I suppose it's as an approach 
Well, it's it's about understanding your objectives and assigning probability. Like, where are you most likely to receive points? And you look up at the grounds. Anfield is not a ground Arsenal have done well at in how many years? So the the chance of you doing well is very very low. So why not stack the oh boat God, on we get an Anfield. opportunity that you've got more points? Yeah. So like, <sighs> I, look uh, on the Gary Neville thing really quickly. One thing I'll say is it strikes a bitterness. That's all I'm gonna say because it's just. It's appreciating change in one team, but not another, when he talks about us and Manchester City. So there's no logic in terms of how I follow his approach and his conclusions, you know, of the past. You know, when you look at Manchester City, factually, the run that he speaks of them potentially going on, there's not enough games for. <laughs> like, just from a pure logic standpoint, when he talks about past runs of 13, 14 games, we don't have that many games left. So uh, he's wrong um, in that sense. But... In terms of us maybe looking at Anfield as, you know, a, a fixture to be scared of, I don't think this team is scared of challenges. Do I think it's an easy game? No. Do I think that the probability of us winning is high? Uh, I don't, actually. Like, I, I think it's going to be a very difficult game. But you don't need that. And like I said from, I think, a past pod, when you're fighting for top four, the metric is maximizing your points outside the top six. When you're fighting for a title, the metric is doing that but also maximizing all of your points at home to rivals. Away is where you will predict potentially to come into trouble. So as long as you've uh, kind of done your job at home, away doesn't matter as much. And we did it. Liverpool, we have done our job at home in that fixture. So for me, even though everyone's going to be very emotional in terms of the title run-in, saying, oh God, that's the six points right there, Anfield that he had for me, you have to imagine that Manchester City are going to be facing not just that, by the way, because they still have themselves to go to Anfield and us, which I don't Do know we, why. No, uh, no, it's at home. Oh, is it at home for them? Yeah, but it's it's at home for them. It's at the Etihad, but it's a week before us. Liverpool yeah. could, in, in a feasible world, Liverpool could beat City the week before we play them. I think Manchester like, City have their own... We're, we're looking at Anfield and... Let's say they have their own demons to contend with. We have our own. And and for me, if I'm prioritizing things, I certainly believe that coaches prioritize fixtures. Um, do, do I think it's at the expense of a free hit, in quotes? No. But I guarantee you the coaches are maybe looking at Anfield potentially as a worrying fixture, but making sure, let's maximize this run. Fulham, Palace... Yep. Sporting, perfect win yeah. record allows you yeah. to lose at Anfield and be yeah, fine. You've got a, you've got a bunch of games. Uh, just quickly on Gary Neville, I always think something people don't take into account. He is so busy; he cannot watch football enough. Apart from the games he covers, he like runs football clubs, runs hotels, is like running for parliament, and and then like comments on football. I'm like, mate, you're doing too much, my man. Um, Right, let's do a couple of questions and then uh, unfortunately I've got to finish a little bit soon. Uh, we've got a question from Caleb, who is I'm C. Friedland, uh, who says, is Ben White the best footballer in the league? And we've also had a question from Craig, who is at Krog underscore AFC, and says, why is Ben White the best right back in the world? <laughs> Brad? Um, it's because he doesn't give a shit about football. He doesn't give a fuck, does he? <laughs> <laughs> that's why he's that's why he's so good I like so I good. like that when he scored his goal him. he looked like he didn't know he could do like you could score goals in football he was like <laughs> oh yeah great <laughs> <laughs> it looked like someone who's like just discovered that like right backs are allowed to <laughs> shoot <laughs> he was like and oh, I also cool. don't know if you guys uh, if you guys caught like everybody saw the Ben White celebration with Neto in the face at the end of the goal but I don't know if anybody caught there was a play right before that Neto punches him like in the in the head that's a big reason why he yeah, did that. Punches like, him I, back I, I missed, like, I missed I this question as well from Sav, who says, is Ben White the best footballer in footballing history? And I think the answer to Maybe. best in league, best in world and footballing history is all is yes. Love Ireland. Yep. Just for that celebration. <laughs> if we if we win the league, that celebration is iconic. That's that's Keown on, on <laughs> Vanessaroy. That's that that's this this team's Keown on Vanessaroy. Like it's it's such unbelievable shithousery. I love it. Brad, we have just got time. Just for a little bit of Arsenal trivia. Someone got really annoyed at me. The same guy in the email who was annoyed about me making a blowjob joke. He got annoyed at me for um, doing the Arteta gag. You know, the thing where I got pretended Arteta was calling me. He was annoyed at me. He said it was puerile. <laughs> 
<laughs> Puerile. <laughs> Got to disinfect that after Guys, two. Wow. Like, we're in our 20s. <laughs> Galma, Galma. It's just a joke. <laughs> Your question last week was... Oh, sorry, Mikkel. <laughs> Your question last week was... Americans... Mikkel's calling with the answer. ...and Canadians <laughs> for Arsenal. And I asked you, oh, call yourself an Arsenal fan? Well, which Canadian just signed for the women's team as a goalkeeper? Oh, I ain't got God. a fucking clue. You sexist. You no, sexist. It, it's going to come to me because it's um, <laughs> it's, an, it's an Italian, like a D'Angelo. Yes. What's yep. her first name? It's, it's an Italian. That's, it's that's definitely the correct D'Angelo. surname. That's the correct yes. surname. D'Angelo... Go on. Francesca. Teenage No, witch. it's an S. It's an S. It's an S. Stephanie, Sabrina. Steph- uh, okay. Stephanie. You, no, that's my you girlfriend's name. That's why I'm You said one of them. So, Sabrina. 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 Sabrina D'Angelo. Yeah. Sabrina the teenage D'Angelo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, George, you're welcome to this. Uh, and your question for this week is about grounds where we have won the Premier League. Uh, the theme was grounds where we won the Premier League and I'm going to ask you in what two seasons did Arsenal win the league at White Hart Lane in which at two seasons lane. did Arsenal win the league we won the league at Enfield at the we lane. won it at the lane so the answer for example could Stay be 2022-23 and another. Uh, and a theme, please. I wish, I'm sorry, Bradley. I wish we had an away fixture at Tottenham Hotspur, like, f- come the end of this, I wish we had That's it. Lovely, oh, but I need winning it at the toilet bowl. That's lovely. But I a, theme a theme for next week. Uh, okay, we're going to go uh, for a question on the Love Island Maldini himself, Nathan Benny Macken. White, White, White. Right. Uh, white. Brackets. Benjamin. Uh, yes, not the colour or the skin tone. You racist. Yeah, oh, so you show me up there, haven't you? Imagine if just I just came in with like long laundry list of faults that we've had. God, yeah, I'm. <laughs> so you, I, I really the scandal. To... We might as well add that to the You're list. You're getting cancelled, mate. <laughs> what I love is that imagine getting so annoyed about someone making a blowjob joke on a podcast that you email. You e- you don't just go oh that annoyed me and turn it off. You email him. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> who uh, even emails anymore? Other than Fluid and Nathan Baroda, who are we have? Do you know what? We haven't heard from Nathan Baroda in years. It's it's got to be years at this point. Nathan Nathan Baroda, George, and to context to any uh, later different listeners, new listeners. He was he used to he used to get in touch every week. Top guy. I think he's like a Labour councillor. Like in the UK, like politician or something oh, for wow. Berry. He's probably busy. He's probably chatting to Gary Neville in Berry. That's where Gary Neville's from. <laughs> chatting to Gary. He's probably he's probably hanging out with Gary Neville. <laughs> right. Ultimately, Nathan Broder this moment in time. What would be different? Knock. Thank you, Arsenal. <laughs> right, boys. A pleasure as always. I really enjoyed that podcast. That was that was good fun. It was a lot of fun. Good fun. We'll be back as always after Sporting Lisbon. Uh, although I actually can't watch the game, so <laughs> I have to do it. Sporting Lisbon. You two are sorry. Sorry, at the, at the risk of not getting cancelled, it's Sporting CP. I'm sorry to all Sporting. Oh fans. mate, I've Sport. made another. I've made Upsetting. another blunder. Another blunder. <laughs> why is it? Why is it not Sporting? I don't Lisbon? care. You're not going to cancel me on my on my own platform. I'm calling it Sporting Lisbon. <laughs> we'll be back after Sporting CP. Uh, <laughs> for a main podcast and we'll be Sporting back Club de Portugal. Uh, for instant reaction on our Patreon and uh, main podcast on the Friday and then we'll be back on Sunday slash Monday with a main podcast about our 7-0 spanking of Man United somehow Man United will turn up and we'll beat them 7-0 right boys pleasure as always thanks as always for listening keep it different knock and we will see you later peace peace Thank you so much for listening to the Different Knock and Arsenal podcast. Please hit subscribe or follow on whatever platform you're using. If you'd like to support the Different Knock, you can find us on Patreon and buymeacoffee.com. We're on all social media at Diff Knock. Thanks. <laughs>